It's one o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us today to learn more about industrial safety best practices. Uh, we're really excited to partner with FACS on not only today's webinar, but we also have three other webinars planned in the series, a four part webinar series. Uh, my name is Patrick Bello and I'm the product manager here at Bullard for our respiratory portfolio. At Bullard, we always strive to provide access to the expertise and we hope that you leave here today learning more about how to work safety in the industrial um, job sites. Bullard offers a wide range of industrial supplied air respirators uh, like the 88 VX and GVX blasting helmets. Also supplied air airline filtration and monitoring products uh, that protects abr abrasive blasting workers and spray coatings workers. We also offer uh, PAPR devices such as the EVA Packer and full respiratory hoods such as our new Sightline uh, Packer hood. But because both FACS and Buller are fundamentally focused on protecting the worker and promoting safety throughout our industry, we thought that this was a great opportunity to partner together to provide valuable safety, industrial safety and compliance knowledge from the certified industrial hygienist perspective. Sylvia uh, has over 35, 39 years of experience in the industrial hygiene industry and is currently director of the uh, environmental health services for FACS. She's responsible for the exposure assessment and environmental health and safety service lines for the, for the firm. She is currently the past chair of the AIHA Cannabis Health and Safety Committee, and we're really excited to learn from her today. So with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Taylor for some housekeeping items um, and how to manage the webinar uh, Q&A process. All right, hello everyone. Uh, so throughout the webinar today, if you have any questions for Sylvia about any of the content she covers, please go ahead and enter that in the chat or the questions panel uh, that you'll see on the right of the webinar screen. Just enter your question, hit send, and we'll receive those and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar to go over each of those. And if you are needing a certificate of attendance today, um, just let us know by entering that in the chat and sending that to the organizers or the panelists. We'll take your name down and make sure you get one um, after the conclusion of the webinar later today or tomorrow. And then finally, we also have several poll questions included throughout this webinar uh, to keep it interactive and fun. So every attendee will have the opportunity to answer several questions that Sylvia has included throughout the presentation to keep folks engaged. So please select the best answer um, that you see fit and submit that, and we'll, we'll cover those uh, results with you as well as we go throughout. But with that, I will hand it off to Sylvia to get started. Great, thank you, Taylor and Patrick, and welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, we've got a lot of information to cover today. Um, a lot of different types of personal protective equipment that we're going to cover and there's so much to talk about. We're really only gonna scratch the surface on each one of these, but our goals today are you know, making sure you have an understanding of personal protective equipment, um, hierarchy control of controls, which is very important as you do your hazard assessments um, and you know, really understanding the how to assess your jobs and select your appropriate protective equipment. So let's go through a regulatory slide first. What does OSHA require of us? Um, PPE needs to be provided by the employer. That's, that's number one. Um, making sure that your employees are actually using the PPE that you have provided for them and that they're using it properly. Um, making sure that we remove any deficient um, PPE, anything that's worn or broken. Um, all of your PPE protect your selections need to be based on um, a hazard assessment. We're gonna talk about how to do that. And then of course you need to train your employees as well. So if we look at hazard assessments, which is very important, we need to go into the workplace. You need to have you know, some keen eyes on the workplace looking at what those hazards are. We wanna try and eliminate hazards or reduce hazards as much as we can as we go through the hazard assessment. Um, and then if we have to, we're gonna use pr protective equipment. Um, and remember, PPE is the absolute last level of control. We wanna make sure we do a proper hazard assessment. So an important part of the hazard assessment is really looking at a hierarchy of controls. This is vital when we, when we do this. If you can see PPEs at the very bottom 
of this list. So we start at the top and elimination. So when you're looking, doing your hazard assessment and you, you've figured out what your hazards are, what the risks are to employees, is there a way to eliminate, eliminate those hazards? Is it possible just get rid of them? Um, substitution, if you've got some hazardous chemicals, um, is it possible to substitute a less hazardous or non-hazardous chemical in its place? And then we move on to engineering controls, administrative controls, and PPE, which those three we'll talk about in the next slides. Um, but it's important to remember looking at this hierarchy of controls. So we really want to start at the top. We want to look at elimination, substitution uh, as our primary means of control. Looking at engineering controls, take a look at your workplaces. What can you do to engineer out the hazards? Isolation. So if you look at the bottom left picture where it's a lead hazard work area, that's isolation. It builds a containment. The only people that can be exposed to that are the ones who are actually in there working and they're protected when they're in there. That way people walking by um, don't have any exposure to that. Um, ventilation, so you can see the local exhaust ventilation on the top picture, the snorkel, which is improperly placed. One of the things that we want to make sure when we're using those is that we put them in the right places. Um, but that is a form of engineering control where we're taking the um, contaminants away from the worker if it's properly placed. Um, looking at equipment modifications, is there a way to modify equipment, substitute um, some noisy equipment for some quieter equipment? Um, if you're working with perhaps silica and having vacuum attachments on your equipment, which most of our, our equipment has now. Those types of engineering controls are important to try and reduce the risk to our workers. Then we can start to look at some administrative controls. This requires the worker to do something. Um, proper procedures. So if you develop your standard operating procedures that take into account reducing the risk for employees. Um, housekeeping, are you dry sweeping um, contaminated dust that can just get re-entrained in the air? Um, and maybe you can wet sweep instead. Um, are there some regulated areas that you can um, establish um, signage that you see in, in these photographs um, to warn people of, of the dangers, part of administrative controls? And another example here um, for noise exposures. Of course, we want to put a sign up where there's a high noise area and hearing protection is required so that people know that before they walk into the area. Um, can we maybe have fewer employees exposed to that noise area? Can we limit the amount of time that employees are spending in a, in a particular high noise area? Maybe we can have them move in and out of that um, noise area. Can we maybe provide a quiet place for them to work? Um, or just distance them from those noises. So that's just one example of many that we can possibly use as we um, go through our hazard assessment. And we're going to go ahead and do our very first knowledge check. So get ready with your uh, mouse and go ahead and answer those questions. Safety controls must meet the following order of priority. can see those numbers adding up. Got about 20 seconds to, to click on your answer. Got some options going here. All right, so that's ended. So everyone can see the, the results of our poll. We're looking at elimination, substitution, engineering, administrative, and PPE controls. Um, and let's see what the actual answer is. And good, the majority of you had that answer correct. That is the proper order um, for those. So in the next poll question, we want more people to answer. So let's, let's get some more audience participation going there. So how do we do our hazard assessment? We want to look um, at the end of the hazard assessment if we have to, making sure that the PPE that's selected um, is the right PPE. Um, making sure, again, that employees are using it and we're communicating this appropriately to our employees and that everything does fit properly. And we'll talk about this as we look at different types of PPE. Um, what are we looking at in the hazard assessment? We have to consider anything that may impact the employee, any penetration from machinery, any compression, chemical, harmful dust. Um, you can see um, sharp objects that may be in the work area. 
um, and maybe you can take a minute and take a look at this picture and, and tell us in the chat what hazards you might see in this, this photograph, because um, there's quite a bit in that photograph. Um, so we can see there's you know different options going on here, looking at light, um, biological hazards as well. Uh, all different types of things that we need to uh, take into consideration when we're doing our hazard assessment. Once you've collected all of that information and you've really taken a detailed look at every work area with a fresh set of eyes that you've pretending you've never seen it before, you've listed all these hazards out, you then need to take that um, information, you need to organize it, making sure that you can analyze that data, understand what it really means, um, and then go back to that hierarchy of controls. And is there a way to do an elimination or a substitution or engineering control? Um, if we get down to it and we really need um, personal protective equipment, then we're going to have to go ahead and select the appropriate types, which we'll talk about today. How do we document? Um, this has a question mark on it for non-mandatory because OSHA says that actual written certification is a non-mandatory appendix. Um, I'm not quite sure how you can do your hazard assessment and not document it, so I'm giving you an example here of the, what you should document. Um, you want to identify what the hazardous task is. What is the task that you're evaluating? What are the sources of hazards and the nature of those hazards? Um, looking at what body parts. Is it the eyes, the face, the hands, the toes, the fingers? Um, what body part are we concerned about? Um, and then what PPE would you select for those? Another option for doing and documenting your hazard assessment is to do a job hazard analysis. Um, and this is an example of one, and there's many different examples for these, where again, you're documenting your job steps so you, in detail from mobilization, setting up your equipment, um, actually turning on your equipment, and each of those steps, you look at what the potential hazards are to those employees, and then you look at what actions you can take to eliminate or minimize those hazards. Um, and then this one has a, a rating where you can determine um, the probability of those hazards. So if you're coming up, it's catastrophic and frequent, like maybe the hazard is there could be a fatality. That is definitely something you want to control for. If you're way down here on the bottom right, where it's not very not likely to happen, um, it's negligible, um, low risk, um, probably something that we don't need to worry about as much. So this is a great way of documenting um, what your hazard assessment looks like. And then at the bottom of this, you can see equipment to be used. You can see what, what training does your employee need to have to make sure that they understand the hazards and how to minimize their risk. And then again, what PPE requirements are you putting in place for that job task? So there's two different options of ways to document your hazard assessment. Um, all right, what are your employee responsibilities? We went through everything you need to do as employers. Employees, um, you're responsible for actually wearing the PPE that's provided to you and wearing it correctly. Um, doing daily inspections before you use your PPE and then at the end of the day, making sure it's still in good shape. Taking care of it, making sure it's clean, maintained properly. Don't leave your respirator hanging on a piece of equipment. Make sure everything gets cleaned and stored appropriately. And then make sure you go through training. Um, your other responsibility is if you do find effective protective equipment, letting your supervisor know. That way um, they can replace that equipment. So you need to make sure that they're informed of that. There are training requirements for employees on the PPE that's being used. Um, you need to train your employees on the manufacturer's instructions for each protective equipment that you're using. Talk about your hazard assessment. When is that PPE necessary? What kind of PPE are they using? Um, they have to demonstrate, you'll see on that last bullet, how to de demonstrate how that they understand how to do this, which means they're going to practice in class how to put that protective equipment on and off. If you're talking about fall arrest systems and they're putting on a harness, make sure they know how to put it on. Make sure they know how to put gloves on and take them off properly without contaminating themselves. What are the limitations of that PPE? You can't have every glove has a different purpose. Um, so we need to be able to make sure that we understand what those limitations are. And then that question comes up, do we ever need to train again? And the answer is yes. Um, I would suggest periodic training just as a refresher. Um, but if there are changes in your workplace, 
you need to do retraining. If you decide to switch out one type of PPE for another, make sure that your employees understand that. And if they are demonstrating that they are using the PPE improperly, if you find that respirator hanging on that equipment or um, you find they're not wearing their gloves um, or they're putting something on wrong, um, that is a given time um, to do the retraining. And we are up for our next poll question. So let's get some participation going here. Who is responsible for providing personal protective equipment to the employees? Give me about 20 seconds to put those answers in. Got a few more coming in. Okay, everyone. I know we've got about 200 people out there. All right, it has ended. So we have the answer for this one is, of course, the employer is responsible for providing the PPE to the employees. Good answers. All right, looking at the different types of PPE, there's all kinds of PPE, which we're going to go through each of the different categories. Um, we want to make sure, again, that we're selecting the right kind. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're going to start with head protection. Very important part. Um, all different kinds of reasons why we may be providing head protection to our employees. If you have flying objects um, in the workplace, anything that may fall, electric shocks or burns, are reasons to provide PPE to your employees. Um, when you're providing the head um, protection, you need to make sure that it is properly selected and used by the employees. So once the employer assesses the hazards and decides that PPE is required, the employee is actually required to wear it. Um, so you need to make sure that they're doing that. We want to make sure for head, head injuries that we are protecting people from anything that's going to fall on their heads or they're going to bump up against something. Um, so those are some of the reasons for putting those on. When we're selecting them, um, we need to make sure that we're selecting um, hard hats that are approved through ANSI standards. Um, so we need to make sure that those hard hats are stamped with the manufacturer's name on them, that they have the ANSI designation number in them. Um, and when you're wearing them, um, confine your hair. You can see here in this photo, the hair is braided in the back. So that's getting it out of the way so it's not going to get entangled in anything as well. Let's look at the different types of hard hats here. So we have two types of hard hats and multiple classes of hard hats. So type one is for anything that might fall onto your head. So it's protecting the top of your head, but not the sides of your head. So type two will protect both the top and the sides. So in your hazard assessment, you have to decide where is that hazard coming from? Is somebody going to drop something from a second level onto somebody's head? Um, or are they liable to maybe bump up against something on the side? That will determine whether you choose a type one or a type two. And then we have class C hard hats. Um, these are conductive, um, so they do not protect, um, does not protect against falling objects or electrical hazards, um, protects from bumping up against objects. So limited use for type C. General use, class G, um, good for construction, shipbuilding, lumbering, great in manufacturing settings, has very good impact protection. Um, and as far as electrical, electrical protection, it's under 2200 volts for the class G hard hats. And then we have the electrical hard hats um, that are good for up to 20,000 volts. Um, and this is considered both a G and an E, so it's the general as well as for electrical, and it does protect against falling objects as well. So how do you know when you're looking at your hard hats? Um, what classification they are. And I know this one's a little bit hard to read, but you can see here on the left side, it does say type one class E on there. And it also says it on the right side where it was inspected class E, it says type one class E over on the right side as well. So you should have this on the, uh, the box that the hard hats are coming in. And keep in mind that there is a service life associated with our hard hats. You want to keep them out of the sun, make sure that that's not going to damage them. Um, they can be replaced 
somewhere between two to five years if they're being used on a daily basis. You want to replace them every two years. Um, if they're used intermittently, um, up to five years for your hard hats. The suspensions inside your hard hats may need to be replaced once a year. Um, they get dirty and they get sweaty. Um, they're not going to provide adequate suspension, so they do need to be replaced. You don't have to replace the entire hard hat. You can just replace that suspension inside your hard hat. And you can see here quite a different um, variety of different types of hard hats um, and the helmet in the middle. Um, consider if you're working outside, you can get winter liners to put in these to keep people warm. You can attach um, uh, scarves that go kind of over your neck to protect the sun. You can get very wide brimmed hard hats to protect against the sun as well. Um, so as you do that hazard assessment, um, definitely take into consideration what those hazards are. Um, and you can see this helmet in the middle. These are um, being used more and more often in construction industry um, because they have determined that the vast majority of head injuries in construction are not due to objects falling on people, it's due to the, the construction worker actually falling and hitting their head. So the helmet style works best um, for protection in the construction industry. All right, let's move on to eye and face protection. See what we can find here. All different kinds of reasons, again, for providing protection to the employee's eyes. I promise you I don't have gory pictures of, of people getting things stuck in their eyes. Um, we have dust, flying particles, chemicals, uh, light intensity from welding, grinding, um, lasers. Uh, looking at possible administrative or engineering control, we can put shields or screens around um, some of the harmful um, hazards there. Um, looking here, we can look at our ability to protect the um, the worker with the eye protection looking at fit and comfort safety glasses safety goggles come in different sizes make sure that you have a size that fits every employee so we want to make sure that we're providing options for employees making sure that they're kept clean um, and that the vision is not restricted when the employee is wearing their safety glasses um, and then they have those on Looking at exposure to light rays. So there are charts that you can find within the OSHA regulations and the manufacturers have these as well, where once you know um, the current, the protective shade that you need will be limited, will be shown there um, so that you can look up, you know, in this case, cutting, whether it's light, medium, or heavy, looking at that current, the arc current that's there, um, choosing your eye protection appropriately for, for that then you have to consider if people need to wear their glasses, corrective lenses or um, contact lenses. We need to make sure that they're suitable for the work area. Um, if people have contact lenses on or safety or prescription safety glasses, prescription glasses, um, they still need safety protection over their eyes. So we want to make sure that they have goggles or um, the over the glass um, safety glasses that will still protect them from the hazards in the work area. So we want to make sure that we take a look at that and provide those options for the employees. We do have to look at lasers and what are the, the um, hazards involved with those lasers. Lasers looking at the optical density. Again, there's charts available to choose the correct eyewear based on the lasers that you may have in the work area. We have goggles that people can wear. And these can be worn for dust or they can be worn for splashes. There's different types. One is not, um, doesn't do everything. So if you've got dust in the area, you can have the goggles that are vented on the sides. If you have chemical splashes, then you want to make sure you have a, a chemical splash goggle for the employee to be um, wearing in that work area. Make sure that these are tight fitting around the employee's eyes so that they do provide protection from, from all angles for the uh, hazard that you have in that particular area. Then we have welding. We want to make sure that we take a look at the type of welding that we have. We have the light and intense radi radiant light there. We have sparks and slag flying around. We want to make sure that we have the correct shade of protection on the employee when they're doing their welding. 
make sure you look that up in the charts as well. We have face shields. Face shields are designed to protect the face. They're not designed to protect your eyes. So if you're wearing a face shield, you do still need um, potentially to wear um, safety glasses or safety goggles underneath the face shield to protect your eyes. Um, and there's different styles of face shields. Some of them have um, protectors on the bottom of those of the face shield where it actually protects uh, under the chin, part of the neck, um, to making sure that we have full coverage for those face shields, depending on the use and what the hazards are in those work areas. Let's go through another knowledge check. And which of the following is considered appropriate eye protection? Yeah, let's see, numbers are going up. All right, looks like we're all done here. All right, and the answer, glasses meeting ANSI standards, which I did not even mention to you, so good answer. Um, that is the appropriate answer for that. Sunglasses, prescription glasses, and reading glasses don't provide, um, they're not approved protection. You can get prescription safety glasses, um, but those are not your regular glasses like I'm wearing. These are not safety glasses. You need to make sure that they're prescription safety glasses. Um, all right, respiratory protection. So I put this slide in here just to remind you that respirators are a form of PPE and we're not really gonna talk about respirators today because our third and fourth series um, discussions in this, in this whole webinar series this year are going to be devoted to respiratory protection. So join us um, for Q3 and Q4 webinars as well to dig into the details of respiratory protection um, with us. So we're going to move on to hearing protection. Um, we need to evaluate the noise levels if we suspect that there's high noise levels in the work area. Um, we we're looking at an eight hour average of 90 decibels or greater, um, at which point we need to have our hearing conservation program, we need to do baseline audiograms. Um, we want to make sure people aren't going to have a threshold shift in their hearing. So we want to make sure that we provide some protection um, for them. So when we're looking at these, um, make sure that you provide options for employees in their hearing protection. One size does not fit all, so we do want to give them options, um, different types of hearing protection, um, as well as sometimes different sizes of, of earplugs because some are uncomfortable for some employees. People have different size ear canals, um, so ear some things may not work for each employee. Making sure that we provide training on how to properly insert earplugs. Um, there is a proper way and a wrong way to insert earplugs. We want to make sure we straighten out that ear canal before we put that earplug in. Um, so let's make sure we do training on that. And again, make sure that they're fitting properly for the employee. Again, many, many options. Um, evaluate, you can have somebody bring in a sound level meter, you should do dosimetry on your employees, um, making sure that you know what those noise levels are. The other thing that we need to consider when looking at noise um, exposure and hearing loss is that we now have what we call autotoxicants, which are chemicals that can cause hearing loss. So our noise surveys are no longer just bringing in a sound level meter and looking at the decibels. We have to look at the chemicals that you're using in your work area as well to determine if any of those chemicals are considered an autotoxicant um, in which they may um, contribute to the hearing loss uh, for employees. So at that, in that case, you would also need to control the chemical um, in the atmosphere. So several things to think about when we're looking at hearing protection. And we're gonna do another question for you. The need for hearing protection is triggered at which decibel level? The answers are rolling in. Is it 80 or is it 90? No one's choosing 100 or 110, I wonder why. Where will we land? 
Well, we have some options today. Okay, it looks like we've ended and the majority have chosen 90 decibels. And that would be the correct answer today, which is 90 decibels. All right, let's move on to hand and arm protection. So we have lots of different things in our workplace that can cause hazards for us. Um, harmful substances that we may get onto our skin, any cuts and lacerations, um, punctures, people that may puncture their, their skin, um, chemical burns, thermal burns, um, temperatures that we need to protect from. Um, we need to make sure that when we're selecting the gloves, the hand protection, um, that we're not going to introduce an additional hazard into the work area um, because those uh, gloves can get entangled into equipment depending on the type of equipment that's being used. So think carefully about your glove selection, making sure that you're not going to introduce um, an additional hazard around any moving machinery. Some things that we need to consider when we're looking at hand protection. Oh, there's so many different types out there on the market. We have permeability. How thick are they? Um, the time that it takes for a substance to actually break through to the interior of that glove material. And then there's different types of material. And at the end of this presentation, we have some references for you that you can look up where it will help you choose the different types of uh, materials depending on the chemical that you may have in the work area. So each of these types of materials that are listed here all have different breakthrough times for different chemicals. Some chemicals may just pour right through some of these materials and a different chemical may never get through one of these materials. So we've got to make sure that we're choosing the appropriate type and looking those up on the charts. We have all different kinds of gloves available to us. So we're looking at the area that needs protection. Is it just fingers that we're worried about? Is it the entire hand? Do we have to protect all the way up to the elbow or all the way up to the shoulder? Um, are we looking at thermal, um, that we need thermal gloves? We need to make sure we have a variety of sizes. One size does not fit all in gloves. And if we have loose fitting gloves on, they can create a hazard for us. So we need to provide options for sizing for our employees. Make sure that they're comfortable enough for the employee to do their job and that they have the dexterity that the employee needs to do their job. There are some glove materials that, that you can put on that don't give you any dexterity at all. Um, oftentimes then we double glove and we put a glove on that kind of fits that interior glove to your fingers to give that dexterity back. So there's all different kinds of options when choosing the appropriate um, types of hand and arm protection that you need to use. And look how quickly we came up to another question. Who is responsible for providing specialized work footwear? Hmm. We didn't even talk about footwear yet. I guess that's coming up next. Glad we've got participation here. All right, and most people are saying the employer, which is true. We do have the employer responsible for providing specialized footwear, not your regular footwear that you wear on the job, but if you need specialized footwear, then the employer needs to provide it. All right, let's look at footwear. Different reasons, just like everything else, to try and you know determine what footwear you actually need to wear. So we've got electrical hazards, um, hot, corrosive materials. We've got crushing or penetrating actions, wet locations. We have biological hazards. Do we have snakes in the work area? We're doing some landscaping work. And I know I get rattlesnakes in my backyard. I've got to be careful when I'm out there. So in the workplace, we probably have to be careful of those biological hazards as well. So all different types of reasons that we can find when we do our hazard assessments. We would need some specialized footwear. When we have that footwear, we want to make sure that we're taking care of it properly. Um, if it's defective, um, inappropriate for the location, we want to make sure that it gets replaced. Um, many companies have a, 
a policy whether we place the uh, the shoes every year or two depending on how quickly they get worn um, but if you see something like this it's definitely time to replace that footwear we don't want employees wearing this let's look at the different kind um, we need to make sure of course that they've been approved um, following the um, ASTM standards there's a couple of standards listed here um, so when you're looking at footwear, not all protective footwear that you may see in the stores um, have the ASTM standard on them. So you wanna make sure that you're getting the right ones for the workplace. Um, making sure that we're looking at the types of hazards that they are um, associated with. Um, things like working in a foundry um, that protects people from molten metal, keeps the metal from lodging in shoes and eyelets and, and tongues. Um, they have leather soles, they have leather and rubber soles on them, they have rubber heels on them, um, built-in safety toes. So they're special foundry shoes. They're special shoes for all different types of hazards that you see in the work area. And looking at this, we have um, impact resistance, um, the instep, whether they're steel or composite toes, um, heat resistant soles on our, our footwear, we can have metal shanks, specialty footwear that may need metatarsal guards, liquid or chemical resistant boots. Do we have conductive or non-conductive? Um, conductive footwear is used in areas where you want to dissipate the static electricity so that it doesn't build up. So if you're working around um, grains or other things where static electricity may build and you don't want to spark, you need conductive footwear. Um, and that wear, in that case, you also have to make sure you're wearing the right type of socks. Silk, wool, and nylon socks can um, produce static electricity. So you probably want to make sure our employees are, know to wear cotton socks when they're in a conductive environment. We have metatarsal guards that you know, protect the instep for impact and compression protection. We have toe guards that also protect for impact and compression. Um, we have non-conductive work boots that are good for lower voltage and, and some that are for higher voltage um, workers. So again, there's all different kinds available out there um, for use. Let's do a knowledge check. This one's a true false question coming up, potentially. Common causes of foot injuries include crushing, penetration, molten metal, chemicals, slippery surfaces, and sharp objects. That's a lot of information in one statement look nobody's saying false somebody gonna go in there now ah, we've got one just to make me happy that we've got a few people choosing a different option all right very good the majority wins that is a true statement all right let's look at body protection Sometimes we do have to protect the entire body. Um, intense heat, we might need some protective clothing for that. Um, splashes, different kinds of chemicals, um, sharp objects. So you saw on a, a slide a, a while back where you had, you saw somebody wearing a mesh apron with mesh gloves because they were sharpening knives. Um, good reason to have some body protection on. Um, infectious materials, if we're working in, in healthcare, we may have some infectious materials or in pharmaceutical or other areas. Um, any radiation protection. When we're choosing body protection, we need to make sure, again, we're choosing the right size for the employee. We don't want any loose sleeves. Um, we don't want loose straps on aprons. Uh, we wanna make sure that everything's kind of tucked into place and fitting well. Um, we need to look at the material that the body protection is made out of. If you're looking at chemical exposures, again, look up on the charts, make sure you're choosing the right fabric with the right coating on it for the chemicals that, are, that you're being exposed to potentially. And as these um, coveralls, whatever it is you have, um, get worn, get chemicals on them, it's time to replace them. Many of them are disposable, some are not, some are, are cleanable, so it depends on what you're purchasing. We have all different kinds of body protection here. So you can see the blast suit. Um, you can see the coveralls that have a chemical coating on them here. And you can see just your basic coveralls to keep people clean. Um, there's lab coats. There's different types of coveralls. There's vests and jackets. There's aprons and 
surgical gowns, um, full body suits, all different thing, types of things to keep in mind that are available for you. So and you can see again here, um, some that may be impermeable to some different types of chemicals as well. And we have another knowledge check for you, just trying to keep you all awake. So which of the following is not considered PPE? Rubber gloves, glasses meeting ANSI C87, sports shoes or earmuffs. And it looks like sports shoes are winning. That's something we probably shouldn't be wearing in the work area if we have hazards associated with our feet. So that's a good choice right there. All right, um, that ends our very brief review of all the different types of personal protective equipment out there. Um, make sure that you remember to assess workplace hazards. Um, look at engineering controls, um, work practices um, to eliminate, reduce the hazards first. And then of course, select the appropriate protective equipment um, for the job. We appreciate everyone's attendance today with us. And we are going to move on to the question and answer section. So Taylor's back on with us to see if we had any questions. Yes, we had several come in. And if anybody else has any additional questions for Sylvia, remember to enter those in the questions pane in the GoToWebinar platform now. But we'll get started with a few that came in during the presentation, starting with, are bump caps considered hard hats? It's considered a bump cap. Um, it's, it's not there to protect from falling objects um, or from um, anything hitting the side of the head. It's really there just to protect if you're going to bump into something, if there's a low ceiling. Um, so they have very limited use in the workplace. All right, next question. Is there a fit testing requirement for hearing protection? I don't know that there is an actual requirement for fit testing, but it is something that you should be doing to make sure that those um, earplugs or earmuffs are properly fitting your employees. Otherwise, they're not, you're not going to get the attenuation factor that they're designed to give you um, if there's an improper fit. So providing options, different sizes, and then making sure they fit is definitely the right thing to do. Okay. Uh, what is the useful life of a hard hat? So um, if they're used on a daily basis very frequently it's roughly about two years if it's not as frequent they can go up to about five years um, and no nothing past the five-year mark the new helmets that are coming out are good for about 10 years um, you can look on the inside of the hard hat and there should be a date stamp on the inside of that hard hat as to when it was manufactured and that's the start of that time frame for you and that will be on the inside of the hard hat all right Next question, please address the 85 dBA threshold and the requirement for a hearing conservation program. So hearing conservation program, when you get to that, that threshold, you definitely want to put um, hearing conservation program in place. Um, so looking at the noise levels, um, making sure you have your written program. Um, and then if you're going to get to that 90 threshold, making sure hearing protection is provided to your employees. Um, and different states have different requirements as well. So the 90 is the federal requirement. Um, some states may have the 85, um, but definitely at 85 is your threshold um, to start putting a hearing conservation program into place. All right, next question. How often is it required to perform the uh, audiometry testing? If you're required to have um, employees doing hearing using hearing protection, then audiometric exams need to be done on an annual basis. You want to make sure before they do that exam that they have some quiet time before they go into the exam. Um, we usually ask for about 14 hours, so you want to let them know that they shouldn't be doing any work in their workshops at home on, on Sunday afternoon if they're going to have a hearing test on Monday morning. We want those ears to rest before they do that exam. All right. And then one question that just came in, it's a little bit longer, so bear with me here. 
Okay. How do we begin a health screening program for hazardous materials like cadmium? Local doctor's offices don't have any info on this and local government aren't answering phones. Health screening for things like cadmium. So um, ACGIH has threshold limit values um, and they also have what we call biological exposure indices. Um, and those will tell you which of the chemicals that are in your workplace um, at, at, at levels that may cause um, hazard. Um, it will tell you if you need to do biological monitoring. And it will tell you how to do it, whether you're looking at um, blood sampling um, or urine samples and what analyte you're actually looking because when that chemical is ingested, it may be metabolized to something different. So you'll find something different in the blood or in um, the urine. Um, so those biological exposure indices will tell you. Um, so if you're in that position where you have one of those chemicals that has a biological exposure indice, you'd probably need to talk to an occupational physician and they will be able to set you up with the biological monitoring. Um, there's also some on-site um, safety um, companies that come on onto your site that can do them as well. Um, we can provide some some references um, for those that come on site um, to do that biological monitoring if it's necessary. Got it. And then another question, do we need to select uh, different gloves depending on the rate of vibrations? Yes, um, I actually didn't have vibration gloves in my slides, but yes, there are different um, ratings for the anti-vibration gloves. So you do need to know what kind of equipment you're working with um, and then choose your glove appropriately. All righty. And let's see, I'm just scanning through the questions here. All right, last question it looks like that we've got that's come in. Um, what are the current guidelines for use of helmets as opposed to hard hats? So the new helmets that are out, um, I did mention that they're being used in construction because most of the um, head injuries are occurring um, in construction, at least from people falling as opposed to objects falling on top of them or hitting them on the side. Um, so they do provide that type of protection if somebody's going to fall and hit their head. The other advantage of those um, is that they do have the chin strap that they keep them in place for the employee. Um, regular different types of hard hats that I went over can also, um, some of them do have chin straps as well to keep them in place. Um, so the different types of hard hats all have a place in industry. It really depends on your hazard assessment um, and which one is appropriate for you. So the helmets are an option as in addition to all of the others. Okay, and then, I'm sorry, one more question came in, Sylvia. Uh, could you elaborate on your comments on dexterity of gloves and how to improve dexterity? Yeah, so there are some chemical resistant gloves um, that when you put them on, um, they're difficult, they're kind of flat and, and they're the fingers in them um, just don't give you that kind of dexterity that you need because they're very um, kind of crinkly. I can't think of the name of one of them right now, but um, if you've got those gloves that that are that chemical resistant and they don't, it's not like a nitrile glove that fits nicely on your hand. Um, some of them just don't fit nicely. So if you put like a nitrile or a, that type of glove over it, it it forms that inner glove to your fingers to give you the dexterity back that you need in your fingers. Um, I wish I had an example of one of those. I, I, I don't have one, but uh, if you're picking one that there's not some dexterity, give me a call and we'll make sure you get the right kind. <laughs> all right, and that's, that's all of the questions. Um, so Patrick, if you wanna close. Sure. Yeah. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you, Sylvia, for leading us through that, that presentation. Um, our next uh, webinar in our four part series will be May 14th and uh, we'll be covering uh, heat, heat illness and ways to avoid heat stress as we head into the, the spring and summer months. So uh, you can go ahead and scan that QR code to get registered and sign up for the next webinar in our series. Thanks everyone for uh, joining us for this webinar and we look forward to seeing you at the next. All right. Thank you, Thank everyone. You.